What's up, everybody? We're doing a Codex Chaos Knights review here. It's a little bit different style, as you can obviously tell. Um, the camera's not ideal. That's on me. We just haven't done a Codex review in a long time, and I've moved since then, and things have changed. So um, normally we would have like the camera over the top, and you can see all the pictures very clearly. This this time it's not going to be the case. When I talk about a page, I'm going to hold it up and give you a shot of it like this. But that's about it, and then I'm just going to put it down and start talking about it again. So, again, not optimal, and I apologize about that, but um, it's mostly the discussion on this with the pictures kind of aiding that process that should be the overall pretty cool thing here. Uh, so I was doing this earlier, but I'll just show it again. The Codex is a full-fledged Chaos Knights Codex in that it has pictures, it's got a little bit of fluff for you. It shows some painting schemes. It talks about each unit there for you. Just like every other codex has in 8th edition so far, that's been kind of the formula. Even talking a little bit about where they appear in battles and timelines and stuff like that. Talking about how corrupted knights even happen. There's some funny little like quotes from Chaos Knight pilots, which are people that just become basically grafted to the, can of the, the cockpit and stuff like that. But we're just going to jump into it. I always say this, but we're going to try not to make it a four-hour codex review, but it ends up being a long one anyways, because I like to say a lot of words. So starting right off the bat, and again, you can just kind of, these pictures are just to aid a little bit, but yeah, I think actually now that I, I look, you can't really see anything detail-wise, so this is just like visual aid, but it won't give you all the numbers. I will give you the numbers via words. So... You have your war dogs, which are going to be the little guys, the Helverns, and stuff like that. They're exactly the same. They do not get any new weapons. They do not get any new rules. Um, in fact, they kind of they lose more rules than they gain, is what I would say. Um, but that's okay. Uh, they just kind of help fill out night detachments, and you still have access to some very good ones. I would even say, and this is getting a little ahead of myself, but the Preceptor equivalent knight versus uh, the Chaos version is better. Slightly better. Um, it's still probably not even close to the best knight you can take. It's it's not. Um, so that's where it becomes a little bit kind of... You want to go that route. But if you're someone that owns like six models of Helverns or something like that, or War Dogs in this case, and you're like, well, I really want to convert those to Chaos and play them, you have a slightly better option. But anyways, they kind of talk about the same stuff over here. Um, so they're Quester Traitorous, uh, and then you get to pick between two households. It's either Infernal or Iconoclast, and I'll talk about the differences between those when we get to that page. But that's your two houses. There are Dreadblades, and I would say that these have better rules than their Imperial equivalent. Um, they're more playable. Still has that fun RNG feel of sometimes you roll a bad dice and you just get kind of bad rules, and you're like, wow, I guess this game, I'm not quite as cool as I used to be. Um, so I don't know that you'll take them a whole lot, but maybe I'll be wrong. Or maybe you're all about that. Um, I don't think it explains it here, but you still get the six command points for three knights in the detachment. Um, it's it's exactly the, the same as the Imperial ones, is basically what I would say at this point in time. So I'm not even going to really go over the War Dog. I guess at this point in time, just for complete coverage, uh, it's worth noting. And other releases and even the GW preview itself showed this but you're not a demon engine uh, you're not a demon you don't get to take a demon god or anything like that so there's no mega buffs across the board there's no super big combos this codex is insular in that the buffs and stuff that you get from this is within the codex um, there's very little ways to get a lot of synergy in terms of a slanesh uh, prince giving you reroll ones or something like that like nope none of that's really happening so that's uh, disappointing for some, but probably better for the game. It probably would have been insanely over, just in incredibly broken if they would be able to take demon gods and have all the stratagems and stuff open up to them. So it makes sense. So let's start off with your basic knight, the knight despoiler. And again, I know you can't see much on the on the picture. You'll have the codex soon, but just listen to my words and use the pictures to paint a beautiful image in your mind. The knight despoiler is kind of the it is the beginnings of your Gallant, Warden, um, 
all those guys just just the basic knight you get to add stuff to it it comes stock with a stubber reaper chain sword and thunderstrike gauntlet well uh, titanic feet now let me mention this right now because there is there is confusion on this i myself was confused but i went right to the horse's mouth and if you go to the back of the the codex and look at points there is the knight desecrator we're not at yet we're at the knight despoiler which starts at 285 you then have to pay for all of its weapons. So if you just take the Stubber and you just take the Chain Sword and Thunderstrike Gauntlet, that is plus 67 points, which does put it slightly higher um, than some of these other knights. Actually, the Heavy Stubber, yeah, it's two points, so that's 67 points higher. That's funny, I'm looking at this and I'm like, well, hang on. Now I'm confusing myself. The Knight Despoiler. So what's kind of funny about that is you then go down below the Knight Despoiler in the Codex for the points. It says Knight Despoiler with one Reaper Chainsword and one Thunderstrike Gauntlet. 305. Yeah, they're just, it's even confusing me just to look at this right now. <laughs> I'm actually brain, like, I, I talked to Reese about this because I looked this up and this was so weird to me. Um, because if you go to the Night Despoiler page, it says it starts with a heavy stub, a Reaper Chain Sword, Thunderstrike Gauntlet, and Titanic Feet. So why would I not start it off at 285, just add those, and then save myself 20 points? But then right below that is Knight Despoiler with one Reaper Chainsword and one Thunderstrike Gauntlet, 305. So I mean, I guess you have to do a little bit of mental work here. If you're not going to add those things, you can start off at the 285, so like the double Gatling, which is uh, what I did, but now I'm thinking I added the wrong points to it, or maybe I didn't actually. Anyways. So I think if you if you do start with the melee version, you actually have to add 20 points to yourself, which is a little bit weird in the codex, I would say. That's kind of like a unspoken nerf, which makes sense if you read it literally, but I think you can get kind of confused and locked up on this and, and weirded out. So I, for right now, that's how I would read it. I think that's how it's meant to be. You're going to take a Knight Despoiler and give it a Battle Cannon, and then a Chain Fist, or not a Chain Fist, but a... Thunder Gauntlet and stuff like that, and then a Stubber and maybe a Carapace weapon. Then you start at the 285, but if you just want yourself to have a non-Knight Rampager, which I'll get to in a second, which is kind of weird, um, then you actually have to start off at 305, then add the 67 points. So that is that is how I would read that. Uh, of course, in the comments or here on the live stream, let me know if you read that very differently, but I believe that's what Reese told me. But then, to further complicate things a little bit, if you just give it the Thunderstrike Gauntlet and Sword, it automatically goes up one attack, it says this on the page, and then it gains one weapon skill. So it effectively becomes the Gallant, right? So it has one more attack, and it's hitting on twos as opposed to threes. That's inbuilt. But then the Knight Rampager is exactly a Gallant, which is what the Knight Spoiler can become. Only it has one additional rule, and if you miss that one additional rule, then this page is very confusing for you as well. It has Frenzied Rampage. And this is where it could have been really incredible, but instead it's just kind of okay. And I'll tell you my thought process on this. So Frenzied Rampage, when res uh, resolving an attack made with a Reaper Chainsword or Thunderstrike Gauntlet by this model, an unmodified hit roll of a 6 scores one additional hit. Um, so you're paying, I believe it's 20 points, maybe it's 15 yeah, the Knight Rampager is 320 points, and you still have to pay the 67 points, by the way. So it comes out to 387. Um, whereas the other one comes out to 372. So it's 15 point difference, and all you get out of that is if you're using the big attacks, on a 6 you get one more attack. Now my problem with that is you're already hitting on twos, you have access to re-rolling those twos, 
And then if you take a, I believe it's uh, the Beast Slayer, Iconoclast uh, Oath, essentially, you're rerolling ones to wound on a strength either 16 or... Well, anyways, doubling out most things, I guess what I'm saying. So you're very, you, you could be rerolling ones there as well. And then you also have the option, if you really want to, to ignore invul saves once per game. Um, if you take the Coronate Relic. So we'll talk about that later as well. But my point is, in what world are you hitting something where you want to pay those 15 points to have maybe one or two extra attacks? Um, that seems kind of silly to me because the situation where that would be relevant would be like other knights, and that's it. That is basically it. You're swinging a six damage weapon that's hitting on twos, re rolling if you want, wounding on twos, re rolling if you want. And if you really want, they can not get an invul save on a weapon that is. Planet Strike Gauntlet is minus four. And the Reaper Chainsword is only minus three, strength 14. But they're both six damage weapons that you're swinging five or six times or more. There's actually ways to get more attacks, too. So, like, I don't know. To me, uh, the Knight Rampager is not the route I would go, is I guess what I, what I end up saying. Um, it's cool, but I would rather just take the Knight Despoiler <coughs> in the... Um, God, I'm blanking on all kinds of names today. My, my brain's asleep. I apologize, guys. But anyways, the melee version of the Knight Despoiler. Save yourself 15 points, which is not game-breaking, necessarily. Um, and then just go with that. Love to hear your comments. If you think I'm just completely wrong, or you can think of situations where it's more relevant. The missed opportunity here is that if it just said if it makes an unmodified hit roll of a 6 when it attacks. So then I'm looking at, like, its stomps, which is already at 18, and has the ability to get higher... And now I'm thinking, well, I'm getting, you know, four or five extra attacks out of that. That's incredible. There's obviously a lot more utility there. Um, I think their fear was that would be too strong. But at the same time, there are other areas where things are very, very strong. And this one is so wishy-washy that it gets pushed away from competitive and into, like, silly territory. But the thing is, it's not even like I say this and someone's like, but Jeff, there's going to be people put their beer and pretzels in garages that are really going to like that. I don't think so. I think they're going to like it in theory and that like it's like the maximum damage I can do is insane, so that's really cool. But I think that's what competitive players feel as well. So I don't know. Not the end of the world, but not the coolest thing in the whole world. Otherwise, to talk about the Knight Despoiler, like I said, it's, it's your normal chassis. So it's strength is 8, it's tough is 8, 24 wounds, 4 attacks, leadership 9, save 3+, plus. all of that is exactly the Imperial Knight. Uh, and that will be your theme throughout this. The difference here is, like I said, when you do go that um, Gallant, now I'm remembering the names of things, when you do go the melee version, uh, you do get one extra attack and you do get one extra weapon skill, uh, just exactly like that one. Otherwise, its rules are exactly the same um, for the abilities down here. It is just a super heavy walker, ion shield, it explodes normally. I think it would have been kind of cool if they exploded a little bit harder, but that'd probably, again, be too strong. Knights exploding is one of the best things they can do. Um, and then it just has the rule Engine of Destruction, which is exactly what I just said, which is that when it has a Chain Sword and the Thunder Fist Gauntlet, it goes Weapon Skill 2 and gains one attack. Cool. Now, where the Knight Spoiler does stand apart from other Imperial Knights, and this is going to be one of the true gems of the Codex, and I'll just read this out very carefully. So you can add a Carapace weapon to it, but I believe the kit doesn't come with that. Don't quote me on it, but I, I think that's what I heard, just kind of too bad. Um, this model can be equipped with one of the following instead of a th one Thunderstrike Gauntlet, one Avenger Gatling Cannon, one Heavy Flamer, one ra uh, and one Heavy Flamer, it comes with the Gatling Gun, uh, one Rapid Fire Battle Cannon, and one Heavy Stubber, one Thermal Cannon. So you can take away its Gauntlet and give it one of those. Then it says... Uh, this model can be equipped with one of the following instead of um, instead of one Reaper Chainsword. All of the same things. All of them. So you can have double Thermal Cannon. You can have double Battle Cannon. You can have one Thermal Cannon and one Gatling Cannon, if that's, if that's the way your, uh, your wind blows. Obviously, the place that a lot of people are going to gravitate towards is double Gatling Cannon. Um, something that was available to Chaos or Renegade Knights in the past will now be available again. 
So that is a Knight Despoiler running at 457 points, I believe, like I have in my list here. Yes. Uh, and that is double Avenger with one Stubber. You do have to pay for the Stubber. I personally will probably never pay for the Melted Gun because uh, kind of the same logic as the Rampager, like having that, paying that premium for something that is a nuanced situation and is less relevant is not as cool to me. Um, obviously, a heavy Stubber is just something you're flanking out every turn pretty ineffectively, maybe killing one or two infantry guys. But you know what? That's better than once every three games you shoot your Melted Gun. And then it misses. So the double Gatling gun is insane. It's 12 shots, strength 6, minus 2, 2 damage. Um, there are ways to make this even better. I'll get to that later. There is not a relic version of this gun. In fact, their relics are very non-gun oriented. They're more to the whole model. But this is still a very incredible gun if anyone's ever faced, you know, obviously Imperial Knights have access to this, but now Chaos. That's 24 shots hitting on threes, wounding a lot of things on twos, but, you know, if you're going after a bigger target, it can be as, you know, a four or five. But with that many shots at two damage, you're going to get some through. And again, like I said, we'll talk a little bit about um, how you can make this gun better and how the knights can make this gun better, but that's scary. A couple of these bad boys are putting out 48 strength six minus two two damage shots. There are certain matchups where that just mulches them, um, Eldar Flyers have a new reason to be terrified. We'll get to that uh, again later in the Codex, but just that weapon profile is very, very good. Even if it doesn't leap off the page and electrify you, trust me, that many shots at, at, at those numbers is pretty scary. Especially since one can get full rerolls. Then you have the Knight Tyrant. This is exactly the Dominus class. 100%. Now, a lot of people theorized and got really excited for a little bit that... Maybe you could have double harpoons, you could have double flame, or you could have all this ridiculous stuff that would make these obviously completely broken. Well, guess what? Obviously completely broken now translates to it's not going to happen, uh, or very unlikely to happen. But in this case, it's not going to happen. So you basically can either have the Valant or the Castellan. Um, they cost virtually, the, I, I believe, exactly the same in terms of their points. And in many cases, they're a little bit worse. But in other cases, they're better as well, which is kind of funny. So you're not going to get that Relic Flamer that rerolls all wounds. Um, that, you know, uh, Traitor's Pyre, I think it's called. You just don't get it. And you don't get the Plasma Weapon that gets to overcharge to Strength 9, minus 4 for 3 damage. You will just not have access to that. Um, there are ways to make these things similar to that, and we'll talk about that, but it is just very different. Still very good, but I think the meat of talking about the Dominus, or in this case, the Knight Tyrant class, will be in the Relics and the Warlord Traits and stuff like that. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Then there's the Knight Desecrator. And this is the guy that is the Preceptor equivalent. Um, so exactly the same. Again, not going to go line by line with all of that, because it is exactly the same. It gives reroll ones to War Dogs um, to hit while they're within six inches of him, and that is it. He comes with a laser destructor, which is heavy D3, strength 14, minus four D6 damage shots, and on a six to wound, it inflicts D3 mortal wounds on the target in addition to any uh, other damage. That is an absolutely garbage gun. Now, I know a lot of people look at that and say, what are you talking about, strength 14, minus four D6? So yeah, if you get three shots, you hit with two of the three, and you wound with two or one, D6 damage can be scary, but for every time you roll that 6, you're also going to roll a 1. Um, and like I said, that's if you get 3 shots off. What very often is going to happen with this gun, or 1 in 3 times, is you're going to get 1 shot. It's going to miss, or it's going to hit. It's going to wound, or it's not going to wound. But all of those checks mean that this entire model's purpose in the shooting phase uh, is just marred by various different ways for this to go completely boobs up. Right? Like, 1 shot misses. Two shots, one hits, doesn't wound. Like, all these things are extremely possible. Um, and then on the D6 damage, uh, this was commonly said on the internet, but it would have been nice had it had been something like with a minimum of three or something. Because just, just very often, the laser destructor is going to completely whiff, uh, and very rarely is it going to get through and then do actually five or six damage on the one wound that it does. So it's, it's a really bad gun on a knight that you're paying a little bit more for to give buff uh, of reroll ones 
to your war dogs. So I will be very honest with you. I have not seen a single Knight Preceptor on any table I've ever been to, and I play probably more Warhammer than any five of you guys listening to this. Um, that's not, you know, and, and now I know I'm cursing myself to people like, I have three Preceptors, Jeffrey, and I play them all the time. I know, I know. They're, they're out there. They've sold the kit. Uh, but I'm trying to tell you, there's a reason why you're seeing Gallants, you're seeing Crusaders, you're seeing Dominuses, uh, you're, you're not seeing Desecrators or Preceptors. Then over to the Knight Rampage, we kind of already talked about this. This Knight is locked in. You don't get options. Um, in fact, you can just, you can kind of see here in the blurred out version, there's just not even the ability. The Knight comes pre-stock, and what you're paying for is the Frenzied Rampage, which, like we said, is that one extra attack for every six. If this was on the, the stomps, I think that'd be incredible. Because it's on the sword and only the fist, the applicability of that is very low. Uh, it's only against another knight. Or if you're playing an APOC game, but even if you're playing an APOC game, now they have different rules too. Um, if you're playing by those. Or just maybe you're playing like a 5,000 point game or something like that, I don't know. If there's a Warlord Titan out there, then yeah, that extra two or one or two attacks is pretty sick, but otherwise... Um, and this is just the armament. It's just all the same stuff. The only different one is, like I said, that really bad laser destru uh, destructor gun. And then we get into the interesting part. So Might of the Fallen Houses. So you can either go Iconoclast Ambition or Infernal Household Ambition. And like any good codex... I think this choice is quite difficult, and I think it's really balanced. I think if you go with either one of these, you're getting some really good stuff out of it. So if you go Iconoclast, um, you get to add one to the model's attacks characteristics until the end of the turn, and the armor penetration characteristic of the melee weapons the model is equipped with is improved by one. If they've been charged, charge, or heroically intervene. They also... Uh, if someone, if an enemy fails a morale che check within 12 of any of these models, they lose one additional model. That's okay. That's going to be that one that you remember every time it happens. You're going to be like, oh yeah, oh, you know what, take another guy off. I just remembered I had that thing. That's going to be how it is. But the one extra attack, just if there's any charges involved at all, is incredible, obviously. It's just absolutely insane. So your, your Knight Gallant goes up to five attacks just for being a Knight Gallant. Well, in this case, excuse me, a Despoiler or a Rampager. Um, but now it goes up to six attacks, and, you know, on, on the stomp, you're now talking about 18 strength 8 minus 3 D3 damage attacks. The minus 3 is a big deal. Um, a lot of models have 3-up saves. Making a 5-up is possible. I mean, you make them 1 and 3, um, whereas making a 6-up is 1 and 6. And then, of course, if they have a 4-up or something like that, they don't even get a save. Um, that's absolutely insane, and that's really, really good. There's other synergy with that kind of attack later. Um, and then also, just worth mentioning, I guess, uh, minus four on your, ch um, Thunderstrike Gauntlet means that if you have a two-up save, you get a six. Minus five means you don't get a save. So the two-up will not save you, and then if you do the Ignore's in bowl, which we'll talk about later, um, Coronate Relic, and that means there's a lot of models in this game that, well, just about every model, actually, excuse me, because um, you can't have a one-up save. I guess there's ways to get... Anyways, the point is, you don't get a save at all. The gauntlet just goes through. So that's that's, that's a lot of insta-dead stuff in this game, just by picking Iconoclast. Um, now, the other way to look at this, too, is you can say, well, if you pick Iconoclast and you go Rampager, now you've got six attacks. And what if you actually roll two sixes and now it's eight attacks? I know, right? Um... That thing that was going to die anyways now dies even harder. Then there's the Infernal Household. At the start of your move, at, at the start of your movement phase, each model with this ambition can use a demonic surge. If a model uses a demonic surge, it suffers one mortal wound, and you then roll one d3 on the table to the right to determine the rule that applies to that model until the start of your next movement phase. When a model uses demonic surge, you can choose for that model but suffer D3 mortal wounds instead of 1. If you do, you can select the result from the table uh, instead of rolling to determine. The model can only use a demonic surge once per battle round. So once per battle round means turn. Um, 
it does say it at the start of your movement phase. So there's no shenanigans here where like at the beginning of your opponent's movement phase or anything like that. But what is cool about this is each model can do it. And it, it's not a stratagem, so you're not limited or something like that. So if you had three knight uh, despoilers that were melee kitted out and you wanted them to be tough nine because there's some strength eight weaponry about to come their way, cool. Uh, actually, I'll just go through the chart, right? So the, first, the number one on this is Dem Demonic Hunger. Add two to this model's move characteristic and one to advanced rolls and charge rolls made for this model. Uh, the second result is Fortitude, add one of this model's toughness. And then the third is Demonic Powers, select one ranged weapon this model is equipped with, add one to that weapon's strength characteristic and damage characteristic. Pretty cool. Um, obvious applications of this is like you want your Gallant to, or again, not your Gallant, your uh, Despoiler or Rampager that's melee kitted out to fly across the table. We'll make it move 14 inches, because that's with the plus 2. Advance it, so then it's d6 plus 1, and then charge it, and that's going to be, again, 2d6 plus 1. Um, but I'll get to this later. There's actually a relic, and then also a warlord trait that adds 1 to the advance and charge on each of those, respectively. So you're moving 14, you're advancing d6 plus 3, and then you're charging 2d6 plus 3. And then there's a stratagem, of course, to advance and still charge, which you do have to use. Um, you don't just get to advance and charge any other way, but that is absolutely incredible. That's a Knight Gallant going, I mean, as far as 23 inches off the advance and move, uh, and then still charging. Uh, but it's at least going uh, 18 inches. It's at least going 18 inches with the advance and with the movement. And then its charge is plus 3. So there's just certain deployments where there's a Knight in your face. There's just, there's a knight. Um, so that's pretty amazing. Between these two, I've been siding with Infernal Household myself for my builds, and that's because of what I just mentioned, which is that I really want my Gallant, my Despoiler, to be in your face turn one. And then I really like the idea of at least one of those Gatling guns being strength seven for three damage, um, potentially. And then I love the utility of being like, no, no, I'm going to be tough nine for this, because I know that when I get shot... Um, that's going to make a difference. You know, there's strength 8 guns out there. There's even strength 9 guns out there, right? So the difference between wounding on a 5 uh, or something that would have wounded you on a 3, now wounding on a 4 is a pretty big deal. Stratagems are almost exactly the same. Um, a lot of them are anyways. So you have things like your rotate ion shields, exactly the same. Three command points for the big boys, one for the lower. Uh, caps out at 3, so this is kind of the updated version of that. You get the heirlooms, so you can make these guys characters and give them relics. You're going to want to do that. Uh, the tyrannical quartz, what makes them characters, and then gives them a warlord trait. And then from there, you give them uh, relics, which is the corrupted heirlooms. Sky Reaper protocols is just those war dogs um, getting plus one to hit against fly, I believe it is. Uh, it's just the auto cannons. Oh, you can reroll one, uh, reroll the hit. Excuse me, so you reroll the hits. There you go. Thunderstomp, exactly the same. Spiteful Demise is exactly the same, different name. So for two command points on a 4+, plus, your knight explodes, which is pretty darn cool. Uh, and then for the knight tyrants, you roll two dice, and on any one of those being a 4+, plus, you explode. And if both are uh, four pluses, then your 3d6 is the range instead of 2d6. Ion Aegis is a new one. It gives you a 5-up invul to anything wholly within 6 of a Knight Tyrant that you that stands still for that turn. So that's kind of cool. Um, but just kind of cool, in my opinion. There's some people that flip out about 5-up invuls and stuff like that. If this was 1 command point, I'd be more excited. But for 2 command points to give a 5-up invul to something chaos, with the keyword chaos, nearby. I mean, people are like, there's some vehicles I could see being nice with a 5-up invul. Sure. Yeah. You have to use it at the beginning of your opponent's movement phase, so it's not reactionary. It's more of a, like, I think they're going to do this, or you deploy around that. But here's the other thing, too, guys. If you're packing stuff next to your Knight Tyrant, there's a good chance it can explode as well. So give it that 5-up invul, knowing that it could also just take D6 mortals if the firepower on the other side of the table is strong enough. Um, pack Dogs. It's the exact same as the Imperial equivalent. If one of them makes a charge, the others get to re-roll their charge. If they're within 12, I think it is. Yep. Chain Sweep, exactly the same. Death Grip, exactly the same. 
Daemonic Guidance System. This is a little bit different. This is basically, uh, well, let's just read it. Use a stratagem. It's three command points. Use a stratagem when a Knight Tyrant model from your army fires Overwatch or is chosen to shoot with, until the end of that phase, one Shieldbreaker missile that model is equipped with can target a unit that is not visible to that model and can target a character uh, unit that is not with, uh, the closest enemy unit. So this is your, um, that's your missile stratagem. It's exactly the same. It just kind of specifies Overwatch, which is interesting. I don't believe the other one's worded that way, but I'm not quite sure. I, I guess that's just to clean up the language, because everyone knew you could fire missiles in Overwatch anyways as well. You just had to hit on a six. Full tilt, exactly the same. In fact, it has the same name. Two command points. Devastating reach, exactly the same. Titanic duel. For this next little bit, I'm going to ask that you guys please put on your fluff bunny costumes and your uh, silly galoshes, and let's go for a journey. One command point. Use this stratagem at the start of the fight phase. Select one Chaos Knight's model from your army that is within one inch of an any enemy Titanic units. Both players secretly choose a number between one and three. Either write this number down or use one D6 that is hidden e.g. Uh, behind your hand. The numbers are revealed at the same time. If they differ, then until the end of that phase, add the number you chose to the attacks characteristic of the model, but attacks made with melee weapons by that model can only target titanic units. So let's, let's go through this logically, what just happened. We both secretly write down a D3 number. Um, so that can be, obviously, if you have a D3, 1, 2, or 3, or if it's a D6, then a 1, 2, or a 3, 4, or 5, 6, or 1, 2, or 3, respectively. If they match, nothing happens. Nothing happens. You just spent a command point for nothing. If the numbers are different, read this carefully. If they differ, then until the end of the phase, add the number you chose to the attacks characteristic of that model. Okay, so if I write down a 2, and my opponent guesses that I was going to go for the big one, and they wrote down a 3, then I get to add 2 attacks to my model going up against them. That's kind of cool. Um, if they guess correctly that I actually was going to pick the more moderate one and wrote down a 2, then I don't get those attacks. So I actually kind of like this. It's one command point. And it becomes a little Age of sigmar -y in that my opponent has a chance to block this, basically. But they have to just guess correctly. I'll tell you right now, the winning... If you ever just want to, for one command point, add an attack to your model, always pick a one. <laughs> your opponent's never going to guess that you are so freaking mediocre that you picked a one on the D3. They're always going to guess either, uh, you know, the two or three extra attacks. Um... But I think that's pretty funny. This is another way to get another attack against a Titanic model, though. And it's only one command point, so I like that. This is potentially very powerful. Um, but I like that it has counterplay actually built into it. And because it has counterplay built into it, I like that it's only one command point. If this was like two or three command points and there's still a way for it to do absolutely nothing, I think that would be the stupidest thing in the world. I mean, not, a, not in the world, I guess. That's too strong. But like, it would be bad. I think that would be pretty dumb. Uh, as it is, it's fun, but it's it's powerful. It is it is powerful. So I like it. Trail of destruction for two command points. Use the use the stratagem when a Chaos Knight's model from your army fires Overwatch or is chosen to shoot or fight with. Until the end of the phase, when resolving an attack made by that model, you can reroll the hit roll. I really don't like the wording of this. I believe this means you get to reroll your misses for two command points. I honestly believe that's what they meant. I think that's how people are going to play it. That's fine. But I really hate the way it's worded because it's just such a Warhammer situation again. Uh, until the end of the phase when resolving an attack made by that model, you can reroll the hit roll. That kind of language is not how they use it in previous codexes or anything for rerolls it stands out as unique you it is absolutely red in my opinion um as you get to reroll the hits when that model makes an attack it gets to reroll that hit 
So if it makes 25 attacks with its guns or whatever, uh, however you want to word that, they get to reroll those. I think that's not going to be too contentious, but I just don't like the way it's worded because it's... It can also be read that, like, you get to reroll a dice with one of the guns or something, or one of the attacks. Anyways, maybe I'm just being alarmist, and maybe there's like, I would never read it that way. Okay, fine. I hope that's the case. Um, but for two command points, your knight gets to reroll its attacks in close combat or in shooting. Uh, so it just says that phase. So you can use an overwatch, then they make it into combat, then you can use it when you swing back. That's cool. Maybe four command points. There's a lot of command points, but rerolling all misses is a big deal. Break the enemy line. And now we get into the Iconoclast and Infernal ones. So break the enemy line's two command points. Use a stratagem at the start of the fight phase. Select one enemy unit within one inch of any Iconoclast household models from your army that made a charge move that turn. Until, until the end of the phase when resolving an attack made with a melee weapon by an Iconoclast household model from your army against that unit, you can re-roll the hit roll. So it's rerolls for melee, as long as you're within one inch of something that you just charged. It's two command points. Yeah. It's just, uh, I guess the problem I have with this is that this is specifically for Iconoclast and melee. Trail of Destruction. I'm, I'm making sure I'm reading this correctly. It's if you shoot, if you're firing Overwatch, chosen to shoot with or fight with. When you resolve attacks, you reroll. Two command points. So this one's specifically melee, but the other one's universal. It's all the knights. Chaos Knights Dragon. Yeah, so I believe it's a completely redundant stratagem. Is there anyone that disagrees with that? Can anyone tell me what I am missing here? Break the enemy line. Use a stratagem at the start of the fight phase. Select one enemy unit within one inch of any Iconoclast household models from your army that made a charge move that turn. Until the end of that phase when resolving an attack made with a melee weapon by an Iconoclast household model. So I think it's completely redundant. Vow of Carnage. These are the vows, which are really cool. So for one command point, use a strategy before the battle. Select one Iconoclast household model from your army to declare a vow of Carnage. Until the, uh, the end of the battle, keep a tally of enemy models destroyed as a result of attacks made by that model, adding one to that model's attacks characteristic for every ten models destroyed. That model cannot be selected for the Vow of Dominance or Vow of Beast Slayer stratagem, so you can only use a stratagem once per battle. So you pick a knight, every 10 models it kills, it gains another attack. It just says 10 models that it kills, um, which is absolutely incredible. So the application here is infinite, right? Like your double Gatling guys chew through hordes of Terranids or Orcs or Guardsmen or whatever. And then it comes time to stomp. Well, I've killed 30 models, so now I actually have 7 attacks times 3 is 21 stomps. Uh, but these numbers can get really gross, obviously. It's just really cool. Uh, the melee version is even scarier, right? So we were talking about this earlier. You can be a Rampager and maybe get an additional attack, or you can just take the Vow of Carnage, stomp your way through 30 Orc Boys, and now your base attacks is 8. But then, oh wait, you're a Counterclass, so what is it actually? 9 when you charge. Nine attacks. Uh, and that's just if you killed 30. You can actually kill more than that with a knight. Pretty reliably. So that's ridiculous. Uh, you'll be seeing a lot of that. And I think you'll be seeing it mostly on the melee knights. But like I said, it's it doesn't just have to be melee knights. It's really just anything. Um, but when you take the Vow of Carnage, you cannot also take the Vow of Dominance or Beast Slayer. That's good. Uh, it'd be really funny if we had some Mega Knights out there. But not the case. Vow of Dominance for two command points. Use the stratagem before the battle. Select one Iconoclast household model from your army to declare a vow of dominance until the end of the battle when resolving an attack made against that model. An un unmodified wound roll of 1, 2, or 3 always fails, irrespective of any abilities that the weapon 
or the model making that weapon uh, or that attack may have. The model cannot be selected for the Valve Carnage or Valve Beast Slayer stratagems. You can only use this once per battle. So for two command points, you have to wound this knight on a four or more. Um, what I like about this is that this is customizable. So obviously if you're facing someone that just put a lot of DAC out there and has no strength nine or anything like that, then this would be completely irrelevant, so you don't have to take that uh, that vow. But if someone spammed a whole bunch of strength nine or ten or higher weapons or attacks, uh, or you are worried about a knight getting into the face of your knight or a Mortarian or Magnus or something like that, all of a sudden this mitigates a little bit more of that damage, and that's pretty incredible. Um, it's good. Vow of the Beast Slayer, one command point. Use it before the game. Select an Iconoclast household model from your army to declare a vow of the Beast Slayer. Until the end of the battle, we're resolving attack made by that model against an enemy unit that contains any models with a wound characteristic of uh, 8 or higher. Reroll a wound roll of 1. So this is what I was talking about earlier. You can already reroll all your attacks. We, did, we covered that through the stratagems. Now you can reroll 1s to wound against something that has 8 wounds or higher. Um, so your Rampager or your Despoiler with a Gauntlet against another knight is wounding on a 2, rerolling, hitting on a 2, rerolling. Um, and then when we get into the relics, you can actually make it so they don't get a save as well. So that's very reliably at least six attack attacks for being an iconoclast. Um, hitting on twos are rolling, wounding on twos are rolling. That's 36 damage. So you could fail two of them if you really want to, and that knight would still be dead. A 24 wound knight would just flat out be dead. So those are the iconoclast ones. Um, I like it because of the customization, like I said. The plus one attack, just if there's any charge involved at all, is incredible. That makes your your Dakin Knights have five attacks. That's 15 stomps. Uh, and oh yeah, by the way, they're plus one rend. So it's minus three as opposed to minus two. But then again, that makes your Despoiler or Rampager just absolute bloodbath. Gods of War, essentially. So um, ridiculous. And then the Vow of Carnage is... Just one of the cooler stratagems in the game. It's only one command point, and you're talking about a knight getting way up there in attacks. You can just take over a game, by the way, is what ends up happening. Um, pretty ridiculous. So what about Infernal Household Stratagems? Well, for two command points, you can bind the souls of the defeated. Use a stratagem at the start of the fight phase. Select one Infernal Household model from your army until the end of that phase when an enemy model is destroyed as a result of an attack made with a melee weapon by that selected model. Roll 1d6. On a 4+, plus, the selected model regains one lost wound. Each model can only regain up to six wounds as a result of this stratagem in the same phase. Um, so there's just situations where this becomes an absolute problem for your opponent. Uh, if, if there's a bunch of chafe that your knight made it into combat-wise, they can just start mulching them and pretty reliably start healing up to six, obviously, but let's just call it conservatively like three, four, five wounds. Um, doesn't sound like the most game-breaking thing, but when you're facing a knight, you have a limited amount of time to do the damage you need to do. And if they start healing back up, um, that can be like game breaking. It can be just like, well, I had the firepower to deal with it on turn one and two, it then healed back up to, to mid tier or whatever, and I just couldn't keep up and died. Whereas if it would have had five, six or more wounds less, it would have died, and then I'd still have my assets. It's a very big deal. Packed with the Dark Gods, this is exactly the same um, stratagem. It's three command points as getting back up in the Imperial Knights Codex. So if it doesn't blow up on a 4+, plus, that knight gets up with D3 wounds. Um, immediately you set up as close as you can. So very good, very strong. It's here. Um, I think the get back up is like 2 command points in the Imperial 1, or maybe it started off at 2 and is now 3, something like that, but it's appropriately priced here at 3. It's just very, very strong. Um, the big deal here is that it's available to all Infernal, whereas the other household kind of limited you because that was the shtick. The rest of what it did wasn't as great, but this is like just a stratagem, so it's pretty cool. Demonic Ammunition for one command point. Use a stratagem before the battle. Select one Chaos Knight's detachment from your army. Until the end of that battle, Heavy Stubbers, that Infernal Household uh, Chaos Knight models in the detachment, are equipped with have a strength character of five. One command point. Um, all my knights, I, I run a detachment with three. They have, you know, it's three Heavy Stubbers, three shots each. Strength 5 on them. It's only one command point, but uh, I think that's really matchup dependent, which is kind of cool, I guess. If you're looking at a lot of tough 4 stuff, then that strength 5 is a big deal. But otherwise, 
Uh, that's it. I mean, strength 5 also wounds tough 8 uh, or 9, I guess, on a 5 as opposed to a 6, which is a big deal. But you're not looking to wound with your stubbers, typically, I would say. Diabolic Rift. Two command points. Use a strategy at the start of your opponent's psychic phase until the end of a phase when a psychic test is taken for an enemy model within 12 inches of any Chaos Knight's Infernal Household models uh, from your army. That enemy model suffers Perils of the Warp on any dice roll instead of a double one or double six. That is incredible. There are huge matchups where the psychic phase is a very big deal. Your Chaos Knights can be allied with demons, which can give you access to the additional d3 mortal wounds um so basically you can with one of these knights have a 12 inch bubble and it's actually off of any of your knights so off of all three of them potentially um of cast a power you will perils and then i will make you take 2d3 and there are matchups where you know eldar guard orcs they only have three or four wounds 2d3 into that that character means that it's probably dead and now keep in mind, this is something a lot of people miss. If you die due to perils, your power does not go off, by the way. So you die, the power does not go off. When a model dies from perils, it explodes within six inches. Everything takes D3 mortal wounds. That's huge. That's a very big deal. Now, obviously, if you're playing Tau or Necrons, nobody gives a damn. Um, so it's not like, you know, this is a relic or something like that where you're locked in. But just to have the ability to be like, well, I'm Infernal Household, you want Psychic Powers to go off, and now I am going to make you hurt every single time. 2d3 Mortal Wounds is no big, no, it's not something small. It's, it's between 2 and 6 Mortal Wounds, uh, and that is absolutely huge, uh, because we talked about the low wound characters, but again, on hot dice, you're wounding a, you know, I would say Farseer, but they ignore it on a 2+, plus as well, uh, a 6 wound model can potentially die. The power then doesn't go off, and then they explode, causing more mortal wounds to everyone nearby. Massive. So let's get into the relics. This is pretty good. I think I'm going to talk about the highlight. It's a... Yeah, it's going to be most of these, I guess, but... They're good. The Blasphemous Engine. Infernal Household Model Only. Uh, other than a Dreadblade. A model with this relic is considered to have double the number of wounds remaining for the purposes of determining what row to use on its damage table. That's a big deal. That is the Hawk Shroud chapter tactic or household rule or whatever, however you want to say that. Um, but it's a big, big deal. Your your 24 wound knight doesn't even look at its profiles until, what is it, like 5? Or six? I think it's six. That's six wounds. It just ignores everything and continues to be the way it is. So there's a lot of application for that. Veil of Morangard. This is Iconoclast only. A model with this relic has a four plus and vulnerable save against attacks made with ranged weapons. You can then rotate your iron shields to the three plus. This is the only way to get that three plus in this codex, um, which I think is how it probably should be. Your knights otherwise have five pluses rotating to four pluses. Um, so it's, it's interesting that it's locked into Iconoclast, because that would be otherwise one of the more desired relics. Coronate target. Once per battle at the start of the fight phase, a model with this relic can activate it. When it does, until the end of that phase, and vulnerable saves cannot be taken, uh, against attacks made with this model, and you also cannot make invul saves yourself. The invul saves yourself is not that big of a deal, because honestly, you're, if you're using the stratagem, you're hoping to kill whatever it is you're in combat with. Um, ignoring their invul saves, or you don't care anyways. Like, let's say you jump into a unit of Plague Bears. You want to make your 18 stomp attacks and just have them only take Feel No Pains. This would be the way to do it. Um, but again, if you're facing, like, a Mortarian, Gilliman, Smash Captain with a 3-plus invul, all that kind of stuff, turn off their invul, knock them dead, and then that's it. You're good to go. You also just don't get your invul in close combat anyways. Uh, there are ways to do that, I guess, I think. But for the most part, you don't have it, so who cares? Zanchian Pyrothrone. A model with this relic gains a Psyker keyword. It can attempt to manifest one Psychic Power in your Psychic Phase and attempt to deny one Psychic Power in your opponent's Psychic Phase. It goes on to talk about a Warlord trait where you'd have two denies, that's fine. And you only know Smite. Um, 
If that model is destroyed as a result of Perils of the Warp, do not roll any dice for that model's explodes or dual plasma core explosion ability. It automatically explodes. If 1-6 had been rolled. As if 1-6 had been rolled. Um, so it's only if it dies from Perils, which is too bad. Uh, the knight just auto-exploding would be very, very strong, but... I don't know. Maybe it would be a little bit game-breaking, I guess. Knight's exploding is already ridiculous. But if you Perils yourself out, it auto-explodes. So, you know get into your enemy lines, and then start casting Smite as hard as you possibly can. Um, here, It's okay. It's a knight casting Smite, and then it's a knight that also can get a deny. Um, it's just okay, honestly. Chaos Knights are very often going to be paired with Demons or Chaos Space Marines, so you're going to have denies. I don't know that this Relic is where you'll end up going. Helm of Warp Sight. Knight Rampager, Knight Des Desecrator, or Knight Despoiler model only. When resolving attack made with a ranged weapon uh, by a model with this relic, ignore hit roll modifiers. That is absolutely massive. So it's just the Knight. All of its attacks get this. Um, it obviously cannot go on a Knight Tyrant, which would have completely broken the game, essentially. But... Um, I'm just, again, this is your double Gatling Knight shooting at Eldar Flyers. They're tough six anyways. If you wanted to, if you take the uh, the demon ability to make them strength seven for three damage, then all of a sudden you're wounding on threes, hitting on threes. Uh, this is, like, this single, this little relic right here just made a lot of Eldar players really sad. Um, because Eldar Flyers are all over the place right now. They're dominant and strong, but there is answers for them, like Orc players and stuff like that. They have answers for these these Flyers. They have bad matchups. This just turned a very popular army into having an auto-take. They're all, like Every single Night Chaos uh, player they're going to face is going to be like, yeah, I think I'll take the Helm of the Warp Sight on this Knight. And they're going to be like, oh my god. Because again... Um, Maybe you kill that knight, and it's not that big of a deal. Or maybe they go first, and they drop two of your flyers, like, pretty easily, pretty reliably. It's a big deal. Um, the Diamondus is the Laser Destructor Relic Gun. It's the only Relic Gun in this codex. It changes it to Heavy 3, Strength 16, as opposed to 14, minus 4 for D6 damage, and still does D3 Mortal Wounds. The only thing it changes is that it's 3 solid shots, and it's 2 more strength. But 2 more strength's a big deal, so you're wounding tough 8 on 2s. Um, that makes the gun takeable, by the way. So all of a sudden, if you have one knight with this weapon, then this weapon becomes okay. Like, it's it's still not electrifying, but, but potentially reeling all misses, wounding on twos, and having three shots at d6 damage, yeah, this gun all of a sudden becomes a pretty big deal. So that's nice. The Tyrant's Banner, Knight Rampager, Knight Desecrator, or Knight Despoiler. So, again, not the Knight Tyrant. Uh, whilst a model with this relic is within six of any friendly Chaos units, add one to the leadership characteristic of each of those units. Start of your turn. If your army is Battleforge and a model from your army with this relic is on the table, uh, on, a DC, on a five plus, you gain a command point. Okay. That's pretty cool. The Teeth That Hunger. This is a relic uh, Reaper Chain Sword. Plus 8, so it gets you to that strength 16. Minus 4, 6 damage. When the bear fights, it makes one additional attack with this weapon at the end of a battle round in which no enemy models were destroyed as a result of attacks made with this weapon. Roll 1d6. On a 1, the bear suffers 1 mortal wound. So it's slightly stronger. You get 1 extra attack. If you don't kill anything with this, then you actually have to take a mortal wound. On a 1. Okay. It's alright. Rune of Nactagra. Uh, model of this relic has a 5 plus of normal save against attacks made with range and melee weapons. That model gains one additional Dreadblade Pact and one additional Damnation of your choice. Um, so only for Dreadblades, but this is how you get the invul in close combat, and it makes that guy just have some extra layers of rules, which is pretty cool. And this is how you get the invul in close combat, like I was saying. Putrid Carapace of Nurgle, this is a big deal. When resolving an attack made with a melee weapon against a model with this relic, if the saving throw is successful, roll 1d6. On a 4+, the unit that made that attack suffers one mortal wound after its attacks have been resolved. So again, you jump into 
30 guardsmen, 30 boys, something like that. You're getting your 3 plus armor save against them. They make, you know, 150 attacks. That unit's gone. <laughs> um, it's just kind of cool. It's just kind of a ridiculous problem for hordes when they look at your knight where they're already like, well, I have to jump on that knight. And now every time I do, it's absolutely killing me. Which is cool. Bound Viridian Psychogeist. When resolving an attack made with a ranged weapon by a model with this relic on an unmodified roll of a 6, the armor penetration characteristic of that weapon is improved by 1. Eh. The Traitor's Mark. Whilst a model from your army with this relic is within 12 inches of any enemy units, subtract 1 from their leadership characteristic of, any, of each of those enemy units. Whilst a model from your army with this relic is within 6 of any enemy units, subtract 2. Um, okay. Leadership stuff's interesting. I think if you pair this with the Contorted Epitome, it becomes really, really cool. Uh, it becomes like there's just no chance at all for them to fall back. Um, and then the leadership stuff can pair well with other things, too. So it's it's got its applications. The Quicksilver Throne of Slanesh uh, just gives you the Slanesh rule. Well, advance or charge is plus one, and then you always fight first unless they have a rule that's like that, in which case you alternate. Um, the plus one advance and charge is a big deal. Obviously, that's the relic that I was talking about earlier, where you can all of a sudden get the plus three advance, plus three charge. The Gauntlet of Asc uh, Ascension. It is the Gauntlet. It's still times two, minus four, six damage. When resolving an attack made with this weapon, you can reroll the hit roll, and you can reroll the wound roll. When a character model is destroyed as a result of an attack made with this weapon, add one to the bear's strength characteristic and one to the bear's attack characteristic. Um... Kind of cool where applicable. Again, if you know you're facing someone that's going to throw characters at you, having a gauntlet that absolutely rerolls its wounds and hits is a big, big deal. Um, but adding one to the strength, probably not as big of a deal, but adding one to the attacks, very nice. So, again, has its uses. And then we get to the Warlord traits. Infernal Quest. This Warlord is within range of an objective marker, as specified in the admission. It controls the objective marker, even if there are more enemy models within range of that objective marker. If an enemy with a similar ability is within range of the same objective marker, that objective marker is controlled by the player who has the most models within range. When this is the case, the Warlord counts as 10 models. So it's objective secured, but you count as 10 models. All right. Harbinger of Scrap Code. At the end of your movement phase, roll a d6 for each enemy vehicle unit within six of this Warlord. On a four plus, the unit being rolled for suffers one mortal wound. Terrible. Um, the 4 plus is okay. One mortal wound. Who gives a damn? Uh, and the amount of times a vehicle is going to be within freaking 6 inches of a Knight Titan. I don't know. It's terrible. Knight Diabolus. Add 1 to the Warlord's attacks characteristic. Yeah, that's good. So you're gallant uh, if you want. With the Warlord trait, all of a sudden it you know had 5. Went to six because it's a iconoclast, and now it has seven attacks because the warlord trait you gave it is plus one attack. Hello, warp haunted hole. Uh, you can deny one psychic power, and then you have a five plus feel no pain in the psychic phase, essentially. Okay. Eager for the kill. When advance roll or charge roll is made for this warlord, add one to the result. In addition, add one to this warlord's attacks characters whilst they are wholly within your opponent's deployment zone. So that's that plus one advance or charge with the then uh, Slanesh throne and then uh, the Infernus um, boost to movement and advance and all, or yeah, all that stuff. So that's how you get to the plus three. But then the. Um, one more attack if you're in the deployment zone. That's pretty cool, because that's probably where you're going. But you have to be wholly within. Remember that. Aura of Terror. When a charge roll is made for an enemy unit within 12 inches of this Warlord, subtract 1 from the result. In addition, when a morale test is taken for an enemy unit within 12 inches of this Warlord, your opponent rolls 2d6, discarding the lowest result, or either result if they're the same. So the nice thing about that is it's like anti-plague bearers, um, but the minus 1 to charge is just a big deal in general. Uh... It's just very useful. It's just always useful. So that's a good Warlord trait. People are kind of hating on the Warlord traits, and I get it. Um, they're not super, super amazing. But 
they're useful at least there's at least three in there that you don't mind having plus one attack you always want the minus one to charge and the leadership thing is cool um and then like i said you can pair that really nicely with like they're at minus two to their leadership as well uh i don't know if you guys heard that it was embarrassing so not bad uh, let's go over the dread packs dread blade packs and damnations and then that'll be it we'll kind of give a, a q a session at the end here and we'll talk a little bit about it but otherwise that is knight's uh knight chaos codex Path to Glory. When resolving an attack made by this model made uh, against a character or Titanic, you can reroll the hit roll. Okay. Thunderous Charge. After this model finishes a charge move, roll 1d6 for each enemy unit within 1 inch of this model. 4 plus unit being rolled for suffers d3 mortal. Okay. That's kind of cool. Daemonic Vigor. When this pact is chosen or generated, roll a d6. On a 1 through 3, add 2 inches to this model's move characteristic. On a 4 through 5, Improve this model's weapon skill character by one. Uh, on a six, improve the model's bliss skill character by one. That's a great one, because the movement's great. Weapon skill, maybe not as applicable, but still nice, because you're always stomping with knights. Stomps are just great. And then bliss skill going to a two plus would be ridiculous. If it's a shooting knight, it'd be really sad if you roll that for the gallon. You're like, no. Knower of profane secrets. Add one of the model's leadership characters at the start of the first battle round. If any model's... If any models in your army with this pact are on the battlefield, you gain one command point. Uh, gaining the leadership is poop, but gaining the command point, sure. But just one command point. Galvanize hole. When resolving attacks made with the weapon with an armor penetration characteristic of one, minus one against this model, that um, it actually counts as zero. Sure. Arc Fiend. This model can perform heroic interventions as if it were a character. It can do so if there are enemy... Uh, you answer then six of them instead of three, and you can move up to six. Sure. After determining the packs, you must then either select two different damnations from the table below or roll 1d6 to randomly generate a single damnation. If any dread blades from your army have any damnations, roll 2d6 for each of them at the start of your turn, subtracting one from the result. If they have the forsaken damnation, the result is less than the dread blades leadership characteristic. The damnation do not apply that turn. Otherwise, these damnations apply. Whilst uh, Forsaken, whilst this damnation applies, this model cannot be affected by any stratagems. Warp Rage, whilst this damnation applies, this model cannot fall back and has a blissful characteristic of 6. Holy shit. Volatile Reactor. Whilst this damnation applies, roll 1d6 at the end of each phase in which this model lost any wounds but was not destroyed. On a 4+, plus, this model loses one additional wound. Warp the goo. While this damnation applies, this model always fights last in the fight phase, even if it charge or has an ability that allows it to fight first. Single-minded hatred. Whilst this damnation applies in your shooting phase, a unit can only be targeted by this model if it is the closest enemy unit. Defiant Machine Spirit. Whilst this damnation applies, when an advanced roll or charge roll is made for this model, subtract one from the result, and then in resolving an attack made by this model, subtract one from the hit roll. I mean, what ends up happening again... Uh, it says any stratagems. So look at you turning that frown upside down, Razakel. Anytime you're playing a dice game, the packs need to be so powerful that the risk of the damnations is worth it. But they're not. They really are not. So you get one pact, and I think there was another way, what was it, a relic or something, or it's a stratagem, to get a second one, but then you have to take another damnation. It's like... At least consider the free blades. Yeah, you're exactly right. It's ju it's just that the same thing happened when I read the Imperial Knights Codex, and the same thing it, it happened. By the way, that's the a nice thing. I guess I looked at that and I was instantly like, nobody's gonna ever do this. Nobody's ever going to do this. Uh, and guess what? I've never faced a free blade, and I'll never ever face a dread blade either. Um, the buffs have to be two times more powerful for the the for the uh, damnations to be. A risk worth taking. So what ends up happening 
I realize I'm under Apex Legends and stuff with my stream. Damn, I messed that up. Oh well, it's just for the video. <laughs> Sorry for the live stream, guys. Um, but anyways, the point is, like, is it going to happen every game? Absolutely not. But because there's a chance of it happening, and the buffs are just kind of like accessible and okay to find elsewhere in the codex, uh, for the most part. Um, means that you know you're you're in the semifinal game against a really good opponent, and then all of a sudden your knight just can't do anything, and you're like, that's a quarter of my army. That is, or it's a knight tyrant or, or something. I actually I don't know if you can take a dreadful knight tyrant. Anyways, the point is like, it's too much. It's too much risk. Those dice will absolutely happen. Uh, anyone that rolls double ones for psychic tests will tell you. So anyways, forget that. If you're out there and you're listening to me, you're like, you're wrong, Jeff. I'll do it every time. Cool. I wish you all the best. Um, otherwise, the points are the same. For the weapons, we already talked about the knights. War dogs are 160 points. And then you pay for their weapons, just like the other boys. The knight tyrant starts at 500 points, but guess where they go with their cost? Exactly the same. And you can't change the weapons is the thing. There's, there's two knight tyrants you can make, the Valant or the... Um, Castellum, as far as I remember. Knight Desecrator starts at 385, then you pay for its points, so it's a slightly more expensive just knight. Knight Despoiler starts at 285, then you add its weapons. The Double Avenger and Stubber is 457, by my count. Um, and then I did a Knight Despoiler with the melee weapons, because I don't care about the Rampage rule. So I that's 372 for me. So one of the lists that I'm looking at right now, and I'll be changing it around and stuff, I'm sure, is... A Iconoclast Knight's Detachment, but I think I'm going to change that to the Infernal Household. I really like, uh, like I said, I like the idea of my melee Knight Despoiler flying across the table every single game and getting in your face and causing problems. And then I like the, having the accessibility of one of my Knights um, having its guns go to Strength 7, minus 2, 3 damage. Uh, the strength 7 is kind of funny. That means I wound tough 7 at, on 4 pluses as opposed to 5s, which is nice, but there's not a whole lot of tough 7. Um, but I do wound tough 6 on 3s, but I think I... I don't know. That's going to take some kind of uh, repetitions, I guess. But then their stratagems are really good. Just the ability to get back up if I want to is a, is a strong one. Um, what were the others? The Diabolic Rift, like I said, there's just certain matchups where a knight gets up in their face and all of a sudden I'm popping their characters every psychic phase. Like, that's a huge deal. Uh, and then causing mortal wounds. Well, here's the thing, Razakel. Um, so I'll tell you my list. So it's it's two Knight Despoilers with the Double Avenger Gatling Guns and Stubber. So it's 457, 457. Knight Despoiler with a Gauntlet, Reaper, and Stubber. So that's 372. And then I'm doing a Slanesh Battalion. Two HQs are Contorted Epitome, Sil-esque. And then my troops are two 10-people ten, ten units of Demonettes. And then one 29-person Demonette unit with an Icon. So because it's Slanesh, they can all advance and charge. I give my uh, Warlord trait to the Contorted Epitome for the plus 3 movement, so now she's moving 15. And then in this attachment, they can move 15, advance, and still charge. If they're within six inches of a knight that is in combat, that unit, they need to pass a leadership to get out of there. So you say you need to screen appropriately against me. I say, please do. Because what I would do with that knight, uh, hopefully it's multiple units for ideal situation, but I would try to stay in combat. Get in there, mulch one unit, pile into another, have the contorted pin me within six, and then all of a sudden, you can't shoot that knight, and it's it's tied up in your screen, and then on your turn, I mulch the screen, move three inches closer towards you, and then on your turn, you die. Or on my turn, you die. I think that would be insanely game-breaking. Meanwhile, behind that is 29 demonettes and Sil-esque, all advanced uh, and got as close as they possibly can so you can now either shoot two double Gatling gun knights in the back. Uh, you can get to work on them because you're going to need to because they're going to be just raining hell on you the entire game. 
Um, ideally, you cannot shoot the melee knight that's right in your face. And then you can start working on demonettes. But on a 1, I get those demonettes back, and still esque makes them reroll leadership, which is essentially um, like having a sloppity biopiper. So I get to roll two dice, two shots of getting a 1. It's two separate dice, but it's uh, pretty cool. So that's the idea behind that for right now. Um, I think the more natural place to go with this is going to be to pair them with plague bearers and just be like, what are you going to shoot at? Plague bearers? Because the HQs are pretty expensive. Still ask is 210. Uh, Contorted Epitome is 195. But if that was Sloppity Biopiper and, and Poxbringer, that's 70 and 60 respectively. So that's a, basically like 300 extra points into the list, which is, you know... And I don't care about that being a, a Nurgle detachment, so I could still probably... Anyways, that's pretty safe. There's some fun stuff to play with that. Warp Sighted Helm plus Dual Avenger Cannon will give Plague Bears trouble? I mean, sure, if you want to shoot my Plague Bears with your knight, you, you do you, baby cakes. Absolutely. The modifiers don't really matter. It'll give everything that has minus one or two to hit the problems, but I don't think Plague Bears is where that becomes a big issue. So that is the list I'm looking at. That is the Codex review. If you guys have any questions real quick, we can do that. Uh, and thank you for the subs and stuff while this is going on. This will be up on YouTube, of course, and if you're listening to this on YouTube, make sure and ask questions in the comment section, and I will answer them there. I don't know um, what other codexes we'll have this year, but if we have any, of course, I will be doing reviews. We're back at it. Can't answer questions like that, Orcs, but any kind of questions about, like, policy and point changes and stuff like that, I'm not going to... Uh, I love you, baby, but I'm not going to break NDA or anything like that. All right. It seems like... Uh, do you see any opportunities for lists with knights and discords together? Yeah, I mean... That was one of the places people leapt at immediately. Uh... I personally, I don't know. I think they're in very similar categories. Obviously, uh, like, the Disco Lords are 160 points, so they're very inexpensive, but they're fast-moving melee guys. Their shooting is really unimportant and not good at all. Um, they're all targetable. So, they're good because they're good. Or would they be good with knights? I don't know that they'd be necessarily good with knights because they all like can't jump into ruins. They can't go up levels. Their shooting on the Discolords is really not good. And then on knights, they can be fantastic, obviously. Um, so they're durable-ish, and that would be kind of part of the reason they'd be kind of cool. And if people are shooting your knights, then that means your Discolords are getting into their face. But like I said, I'm already having a lot of people... When they face me, they just put everything up on levels and say, you can't get me, which obviously has its disadvantages. That means I'm controlling the objectives, and I, I win those games still. But I think if you double down on that concept, you're kind of asking for a bad matchup. Thinking Melee Knights with Purge Contemptors and Derrideos. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I think what you'll see is those the melee knights will pair well. They are more expensive, even the despoiler, not even just the rampager. Like bare bones knight despoiler melee is three seventy two. I believe the knight gallant at its cheapest is three fifty two, or maybe three fifty seven, something like that. But fifteen twenty points less or so. Um, a lot of people are theorizing why that would be. I would tell you that it's probably because that's what the Knight Gallant should be anyways. It's it's too little for how good it is. Um, but yeah, three melee knights and chaos lists will definitely be a thing. The double Gatling you're going to see. You're going to see a lot of that. Uh, getting the double Gatling is going to be interesting. So TOs are going to have a new 
pain in the ass for them, I think, because um, I was doing it myself. They're not on eBay. Uh, they are... There's not really a kit to do it with, so you either have the stuff already, or you buy it off of somebody, or you third-party it. Do you think Chaos Knights will shake up the meta? No. You're going to see more knights. So the shake-up-ish will be that people will have to kit out more for them again. There'll be like a second wave of, of knights, but I think it will be not nearly as impactful as the Imperial Knight Codex release was. Do you need another Galaga? No, thank you, though. I've got uh, three on the way. And then I have an, a, an Imperial one. I mean, if you have one on a sprue or something like that, buddy, I would definitely pick it up off of you. Um, so that I don't have to take my poor Knight Crusader's Gatling gun away from him. Mini Swap. Okay, that's a good recommendation, Orcspit. So check out uh, Reddit's Mini Swap subform. Oh, that'd be great, Rob. I'd love that, man. Thank you. Yeah, it works spit. I'm doing a. Someone linked me Etsy on our Facebook chat, and I'm. I bought three from there. Hopefully, it'll be okay. As a guard player, these do and do not pose a problem. Just depends on the situation. Yeah. I think the the crazy list that'll give problem. It'll give people fits. Is going to be you know three knights and then like sixty plague bears and cheap characters behind it. Um, a full Plague Bear unit is anywhere between 210 points and 225 if you give them the ability to come back on a 1, which you should. And then their HQs are 60 and 70 for the Pox Bear and Sloppity Bile Piper, so that's just 130 points. That's uh, 250, 130, 250, uh, no, 225 times 2 is 450 plus 130 is 585, right? So that would be 60, 60 Pox Bringers, and then those two HQs, or Plague Bears, excuse me, and then you can do a unit of um, Nurglings for 54 points. That's if you want to do it that heavy. So that comes out to a little over 600 points. Um, yeah, and then you would actually have points to spare. If you did three melee knights with that, The double Avenger Galling guys are expensive, which is nice. They should be. They should be expensive. Can Knights be an effective screen for 1K Suns, Psychers? I mean, sure. But kind of a weird screen. Easy to get around them, I guess, and they want to get forward, typically. There will be more Knight players, Valcor. Yep. There will be more Knight players. We don't know how many. I'm theorizing that it won't be that many more. But it's a really cool kit. And Knights are uh, the highest selling kit in GW. They sell more Knights than they sell anything else. At 150 bucks a pop, my dudes. Pretty good. Pretty darn good. Okay. Well, that's going to do it. Thank you so much. Um, Cobra will have this up on YouTube in no time at all, hopefully. And you guys can continue to post questions there, and I'll definitely follow up with it. If I made any mistakes, make sure and correct me there as well. Just be nice about it. I am only human. Um, and then, like I said, for Warhammer content, we stream Warhammer competitive games on my channel, which is In Control TV on Twitch, Tuesdays at about 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Otherwise, I'll be commentating at Nova alongside Frankie, and then I'm about to head off to ATC. And a couple weeks later, I'll be at the ETC. And that's it. So thank you, guys.